Hi, my name is Sandy Baird. I'm here with Kurt Maida, an attorney in Burlington and a colleague of mine on what's happening and many other issues. Um, and we're here today to give a little bit of an update on how we see the uh, situation in Ukraine, which um, I think is an important issue to, to discuss because in my opinion, it could end up plunging us into World War III and that's not a particularly happy thought. So uh, Kurt and I have done our own research we are scholarly types. However, we are not what you would call experts, although I taught history for a very long time. And Kurt also has studied history, is an attorney, and has been a news junkie and a political junkie like me for many years. So we're here to give kind of an update on how we feel about the Ukraine-Russian situation. And I'm glad that Town Meeting TV is joining us to record this. Okay, so Kurt, what's going on? Okay, so I mean, I thought Sandy, we'd start out by just having, you know, maybe a single, I guess you can call it a paragraph mm -hmm. uh, summary on, you know, the parties here, namely, mm -hmm. you know, Russia, the US, and of course, Ukraine. And NATO. And NATO, yeah, another, another integral, you know, part of the discussion. Um, the Ukraine has, uh, just so that people know, that prior to 1991, the Ukraine was never an independent country. Mm -hmm. It was always part of the Russian empire and then part of you know, Russian feudal states, if you go really far back in Russian history, if we're going back you know, more than 400 years. So there was never a independent Ukraine uh, until after the breakup of the Soviet Union in 1991. So I just want okay, to- Okay, let me, let me say something about that. It's interesting yeah. because I remember when it happened. And that was when it became Ukraine, the name rather than the, the, the Ukraine. Ukraine. Right. Because right. the there Ukraine meant they were part of Russia. Correct. Correct. But yeah. Ukraine yeah. can and became when it became more or less an independent right. country. Right. Yeah. And historically, and then you know, a couple other things I think uh, that you know people watching, people participating should know about. The after Russia, the Ukraine or Ukraine. Mm -hmm. yeah, is uh, now you got me saying it. Yeah. Uh, Ukraine is the largest country in Europe after Russia, size wow, wise, in I terms didn't of size, that. not population. Yeah, right. In terms of size, it's the second largest uh, European country, and it's also the poorest country in, in, mm. in all of Europe. Wow. Uh, even you know if you Slavic Europe, Europe and Eastern all of Europe. Eastern wow. and Western Europe wow. it is considered the poorest country mm. in, and in all of Europe. And the second largest after Russia, uh -huh. assuming that we can stipulate that we consider Russia Europe. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. Been a, you that's know, what I was going to ask you. Historic, mm -hmm. uh, you know, discussion. Because many Americans don't see Russia as another European and Christian country. Look, I mean, uh, right? during the Nuremberg trials, a number of the uh, Nazi leadership also considered Russia. A non-European state, right. Asiatic right, state, exactly. the term that they exactly. used to use. Right. So there's always been this, you know, uh, you know, Russia, in terms of its own sense of, uh, if you want to call it self-esteem, has mm -hmm. always felt that they were always a part of Europe. Yet many European countries, especially Western European countries, did not consider them European. Right. I think for a couple of reasons. Just I know this is a. a yeah, this is off. Brief. However, oh, right. it is important to realize that Russia has a different alphabet. Correct. So it looks strange. As does Greek. As, as does, Greece. does Bulgaria. Exactly. As, as do other quote unquote European countries. Exactly. But Russia has this unique language, yes. unique alphabet. Right. Um, and it does contain Asian parts. Russia, yes. But what we're talking about is Russia, which is right. Russian right. and not Asian. And part of Asia really is part right. of Europe. The Russian people yeah. regard themselves, I think, as part of Europe, right? They, they do. Yeah. 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 So, okay. So, that aside, uh, the, Ukraine has always been a part of Russia up until 1991. After 1991, as we may or may not know, the Soviet Union collapsed. Uh, collapsed. It broke mm -hmm. up. Mm -hmm. And what the, uh, the subsequent um, country, if you want to call it, not country, but uh, states were referred to as the Commonwealth of Independent States. It was a loose confederation of states that had 
uh, economic, cultural, and political ties. Political, mainly, right? Yeah, yeah, and 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 some cultural, mm -hmm. and you know, I mean, the Soviet Union was relatively well integrated in terms of its military and in terms of uh, its economy, in terms of incorporating people from these quote unquote Asian states. Like that live in Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan. Tajikistan. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, again, we're going off topic last, yeah, this is the really. last one I'm gonna yeah, say, yeah, right. is uh, a, a number of uh, reports and diaries that were written uh, towards the end of the Second World War by Germans, uh, as they saw the Soviet Union, so the Red Army essentially, mm -hmm. uh, you know, defeat the Nazi Empire uh, on the ground. Uh, much of the forces that were coming in right. were Asian. Right, and Mongolians too. Right? Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Because, Fearful. They were really. Yeah, but they 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 were Asian, right. and uh, even the you know people in the proper Germany were very surprised mm -hmm. by that mm -hmm. uh, in terms of who was coming in representing the Red Army. So, so the Soviet Union was relatively well integrated in terms of you know, institutions, the sciences, education, as well as- What we call country. diversity. What we call diversity right. today. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Their, their army was integrated well before ours mm -hmm. was. Okay, well, what uh, about Ukraine during World War II, even if you okay. want to go back that far? So it, it is actually important to just have a, a brief discussion about that. Uh, the, the, there was an independence movement in the Ukraine, small, but it was noticeable uh, prior to the Second World War. Mm -hmm. uh, part of the reason was uh, what Ukrainians call uh, what was called the Holomir, Holomir, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, so excuse me for those who are of Ukrainian descent. Mm -hmm. but. Uh, that was essentially what they called their, their Holocaust. Millions of Ukrainians died during the collectivization as oh, of, of farming, right. of agriculture right. in, in the Soviet Union. Happened elsewhere also, but uh, Ukraine took a very heavy you know, front, if you want to call it that, in terms of the collectivization process where millions of Ukrainians essentially starved to death because uh, agricultural quotas that were uniform throughout the Soviet Union mm -hmm. uh, were not met. They were considered unrealistic in terms of production. Mm -hmm. And the Ukraine, Ukraine at that, the Ukraine at that time was considered the breadback. Right. Basket of the still Soviet is, Union. I think. Still is. Yeah, right. Still is. And uh, the irony was, even though they were producing agricultural product or produce, they didn't have access to it. And, and a lot of people, millions of people starved. You know who points this out is yeah. the, the historian Anne Applebaum, who, right. who wrote a book, I saw her interviewed recently called The Great Famine. Yeah. The Great Famine over collectivization, which right. is when essentially when the Soviet Union took over private property, private Correct. small farms and made yeah. them state farms, Absolutely. huge, correct? Yeah. And right. she argues that Ukraine suffered severely if not mostly because the ukrainian economy at that time you know uh unfortunately throughout history you know poverty has often been linked with agriculture right rather right. than you know the industrialized cities and ukraine was largely agricultural still is and still is mm -hmm. uh and unfortunately therefore has that title of being the poorest country in europe uh but it suffered disproportionately because it was a largely agricultural state in the collectivization process. And that was in the 30s? That was in the 1930s. Okay. So Stalin was- Before you know, World War II. Prior to World War II. Right. Yeah, we're going about six, seven years before yeah. the Second World War commenced. And Stalin was faulted for that mm -hmm. and was considered a monster in the Ukraine. Right. He always had that right. reputation uh, for the, uh, the brunt that they suffered uh, following the collectivization process. So there was a disconnect in the Ukraine, even then, with the Russian Empire, right. the Soviet Union, and they felt that they were essentially, um, you know, again, and they were disproportionately affected by this and felt that they needed to separate. But there wasn't any movement. The Second World War came in, and, you know, that was. Because uh, that was a mixed bag, too. That was a mixed bag. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so uh, just, you know, want to stipulate that. There was this internal feeling in the Ukraine at that time of uh, not feeling other, 
than what the rest of Russia was uh, because of how it suffered in the 1930s during this famine. So we're gonna fast forward to a slightly more modern time when the 1991 breakup of the Soviet Union took place, uh, Ukraine was essentially considered an independent country, became an independent country. I thought it did before that under Khrushchev, no? No, uh -huh. no. Uh, the only thing was, again, under Khrushchev, Ukraine was so well integrated within the Soviet Union. At this point, of course, you know, we're, when we're talking about Khrushchev, we're talking about post Second World War, right. post Stalin. And uh, a, a portion of Russia that was called the Crimea, right. uh, that is called the Crimea, Crimea, was redistricted. I mean, I guess in US terms, you can call it gerrymandered mm -hmm. uh, into the Ukraine. And temporarily, for whatever reason, they decided to uh, incorporate the Crimea into Ukraine because it didn't really matter at that time because these were just internal states within the Soviet Union, one, you know, one monolith The Crimea country. always mattered though to the Soviet Union, didn't it? It always did. Yeah, right. Right. Well, I mean, Crimea, you can, you know, in terms of historical terms, right. the, the culture of Russia, the, the religion of Russia, the, the great poets, the great, some of the great cities. Mm -hmm. uh, like Odessa. Odessa, mm -hmm. Sochi, where the Olympics took place right. a few years back. Mm -hmm. uh, the They're Winter in the Olympics. Crimea, They're right? in the Crimea, right. yeah, right. yeah. So, I mean, the heart of Russia has always been in the Crimea, believe mm -hmm. it or not. Even they have a big base there, too, in Sevastopol. In Sevastopol, right. there's a number of naval bases. So right. let's let's just talk about the breakup really quickly right. before we move yeah. to, you know, 2021 and 22. Mm -hmm. um, the, at the time of the breakup, uh, again, because of the Soviet, of the right. Soviet Union, yeah, right. all of these uh, different independent states uh, prior to the breakup were part of one, you know, monolith, this, the, the Union of so Soviet Socialist Republics, USSR. Mm -hmm. Nuclear weapons were spread out all over the countries. All, including in Ukraine, right? Uh, and a substantial portion of them... A substantial portion of them were in the Ukraine because you, the Ukraine abuts the West. It was the okay. westernmost "quote unquote" state or region of the Soviet Union that um, that that was close to to the West, to the to to uh, well, except for East Germany. But it, right. yeah, East Germany was probably the most further for, furthest to the West. Uh, but uh, it was a large landmass within the Soviet Union. The East Germany was not a part of the Soviet Union. Right. It was an independent country. Exactly. Uh, within the Soviet sphere of influence. Right, which is different. Yeah, which is different. Right. US, uh, USSR actually, you know, uh, contained the Ukraine. That was a, a, one of the states of many states. Uh, so nuclear weapons were in the U in the Ukraine. It's like Chernobyl. Correct. Right. Yeah, there was like a nuclear, Chernobyl, right. yeah, there was a nuclear um, reactor mm -hmm. in Chernobyl uh, that melted down in 1986. Mm -hmm. So the Ukraine needed money at the end of the breakup, uh, uh, you know, of the Soviet Union. Right. So in 1994, what they agreed to was something called the Budapest uh, Memorandum. Which who said, agreed to it? Ukraine, Ukraine and, did the USSR? Soviet, and, okay. and many other states mm -hmm. within the U, the former USSR at that mm -hmm. point. And the essentially the you know the uh, excuse me go, go ahead yeah essentially the uh, the deal that was worked out was that many of these states would get political and economic support uh, from not just the, the not just Russia but many other countries in Europe in exchange for giving up their nuclear weapons. Uh, one of the, the biggest issues, one of the biggest fears in the West and in the East also, was that these, uh, these weapons were distributed throughout many of the Soviet states. And uh, the fear nuclear was- Nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons. Throughout the USSR. Yeah, USSR. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the fear was that, you know, uh, the proliferation, you know, uh, anti-proliferation regime that was in place at the time was very nervous that these weapons are going to get sold because these countries were broke. Mm -hmm. These states had no money mm -hmm. and you're going to have, you know, uh, bad actors trying to acquire these nuclear weapons or the technology mm -hmm. used to build the nuclear weapons. So there was a international effort to try to place a containment 
on the spread of these nuclear weapons. Okay. And I mean, the U.S. had them. Of course, we right. did. Yeah. We, we were the only power that did for a long time. For right? a number of years yeah, until right. the Soviets until developed. Until the Soviet Union, yeah. yeah. But, I mean, the, the, the concern at the time was that these weapons were going to, you know, just go start proliferating into, you know, whether countries in the Middle East or even other actors that, you know, we considered unstable or even terrorist groups. Right non-state actors. So the so Soviet Union worked out this uh, Budapest memorandum with Ukraine and many other countries. And Ukraine essentially in 1994 decided to give up its nuclear weapons. The weapons went to Russia. All the weapons of these different states went to Russia mm. uh, because Russia was deemed by the international community in a better position to uh, maintain and um, be responsible secure, for, yeah, right. secure these weapons. Right. Probably that was more or less correct, it seems. Right, right. It made, it made sense. There was some kind of consolidation. Mm -hmm. Have them all in one place rather than have them spread out mm -hmm. over, you know, the U USSR was the largest by far, the largest country in the world. You know, I think... Including uh, they, China? Including China. I mean, in terms of ge geography, not, okay. not population. Right. Okay. I think they it spans about seven different time right. zones, yeah. if I'm not right. mistaken. True. Yeah. Maybe even more. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, over such a landmass, it would have been very difficult to control these weapons. So Ukraine gave them up. Uh, what they got back in exchange, aside from you know possible economic um, concessions and aid, was... The Soviet Union, I mean, I'm sorry, Russia agreed. By that point. At that point, Russia agreed that uh, that it would never compromise the territorial integrity of the borders of the Ukraine. Okay. By use of military force or political force. That was the agreement. In exchange, uh, it acquired all of Ukraine's nuclear weapons okay. and weapons technology. Right. That was, was there an stationary. agreement at that point that Ukraine would remain... More or less neutral in the Cold War. Or? No, no. Okay. So that's another important thing. Yeah, Part right. of that agreement was that any state, any state, had the right to develop its own alliances. Wow, including Ukraine. Including Ukraine and any other state, whether we're talking about other former Poland? republics like oh. oh, Poland definitely, but other former Soviet republics like Georgia, Azerbaijan, uh -huh, uh -huh. Kazakhstan, all of okay. that. Uh, so that's important to remember. At the time, you know what 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 took place in the in the early 1990s when the Soviet Union broke up. Uh, in terms of the way I view what's going on right now between the Soviet Union, I mean, so I'm sorry, Russia. Russia and Ukraine, is it comes across really as a really messy divorce. Uh, mm -hmm. Ever since the breakup of the Soviet Union, Ukraine has Ukraine has always tried to tilt towards the West. Right, well, part of Ukraine. Part of Ukraine, right. largely, a, yeah, a good part of maybe. Ukraine, mm -hmm. uh, because of economics and, and largely it's economics. Well, largely but there's all, there are also differences. Yeah. Ukraine is Roman Catholic, or at least part of part Ukraine. Part of Ukraine is, the, yeah. The Western part is mainly Roman Catholic. Right. Different language than Russian. Not very different. No, though. I know, but yeah. it is different. Right. And it is more or less more connected with the Western European countries than the Eastern part of Ukraine, well, which is Russian speaking. Yeah, it's, I don't think it's connected. Uh, I think it, they want to be connected. To Western to Europe. The, yes, Western exactly. Europe. I don't know if Western yeah. Europe wants them that much. Right. Well, here's the thing. So, I mean, you, you mentioned, you know, NATO is one right. of the parties in this discussion. Right, exactly. So, uh, very important to understand. The Ukraine, Ukraine is not a member of NATO. Exactly. They're yeah. a partner. Are they? They're uh, a even, partner. Right now they are? Yeah, but it's kind of like, you know, the, when the United States was uh, a partner to the uh, predecessor of the United Nations in the 1920s. The League of Nations. The League of Nations. Right. It's a partner, right. not a member. So it's important to understand that there's a difference between partnership and membership when it comes to just, if you're even talking about the internal world of NATO, mm -hmm. you know, the essentially the, the agreement that the states of NATO have, if we buy into it, the whole concept, mm -hmm. is that an attack on one of the states right. is an, an attack on all of them. And it's an alliance, right. like, like in World War One. Right, sure, alliance. absolutely. An attack on one is an attack right. on the others, therefore they would have to intervene. Now, in this case, 
Ukraine is not a member right. of NATO. Right. So we don't technically have we us, don't have us, an alliance, right? us, you know, uh, yes, member yes. states of NATO don't technically have an, a legal obligation to get involved as we would were, you know, were there an attack on Germany or mm -hmm. France or mm -hmm. Spain, all, you know, longstanding members of NATO. So, okay, well, I want to go back a bit. Yeah. So many Americans don't know what NATO is. NATO is an alliance of the Europe of Western European powers yeah. founded in 1947 mm -hmm. after World War II to secure some kind of collective security in, yeah. in Europe, correct? Yeah, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Okay, it's the North Atlantic Treaty, and it was composed only then of Germany, France, West England, Germany, right. West Germany, England, France, correct? That's correct. And um, any, any other countries? Uh, there may have been a few others. But, right, and mainly but, the United you know, States. European. Okay, so that yeah. alliance was basically anti-Soviet. That's correct. Correct? And the Soviets... It, it, was, had, it was considered a buffer up against the, the Warsaw Pact. Right, the Warsaw Pact. But there came a point when the Warsaw Pact was dissolved. Correct. So that, that was in 1991. In 1991. And wasn't that as a result of an agreement with the West that the West would not expand NATO onto Russia's borders. Yeah, it, it's actually even a little bit more interesting than that, Sandy. Uh, there was there were discussions at the time, even at the top levels, uh, and there was interest on the part of the new Russia of actually acquiring membership in. Right, 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 right. There right, were discussions right. between the Clinton administration and. Putin himself I know. at the time, mm -hmm. and uh, there was uh, there's actually footage. I mean, if folks you know go on YouTube, or there's a great there's a great uh, interview, a four session interview on Showtime of Vladimir Putin. Really, a few years ago, He's a clever guy. Eh? Yeah, uh, it's it's four sessions. It, the, the interview is conducted by Oliver Stone. I saw those. Yeah. I'm sorry. I saw They're brilliant. This they're, never happens on yeah. 60 Minutes. Yeah, I know. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so. In that uh, documentary, they actually show a scene of, in a public space, Clinton, Bill Clinton, and uh, Vladimir Putin talking about NATO. And Putin actually expressed himself and said that, you know, and perhaps we can even, you know, gain NATO membership. What and, did Clinton say? And Clinton physically brushed him aside. What do you mean? And, and, said, and said, well, you know, we'll see about that. Uh, as in, you know, let's have that Forget discussion it. later. Yeah. But right, to all people watching it and processing it now would say, uh, don't don't bet on, it. don't hold your breath. Yeah, don't hold your breath. <laughs> right. Okay. Right. So the NATO alliance, would you agree, was aimed at the Soviet Union? Absolutely. I mean, okay. its its formation was specifically to uh, uh, to prosecute a containment policy uh, against the Soviet Union. So that the Soviet Union would not expand right. any further. Any than further it. than where it was at the, uh, you know, the borders of the, you know, the Potsdam. Right. Conference. But NATO also, I believe, made some kind of an agreement with the Russians that they would not expand either into the more or less sphere of influence of yeah. Russia. Right. And so, that is broken. Yeah. So what's interesting in terms of that discussion or that line of thinking right. is that in the last week, uh, the and I'm, I'm probably getting the title wrong, but basically the Secretary General of NATO, his name is Jens Stoltenberg. He uh, gave us- German? I think so. Yeah. I think so. The name sounds like that. Yeah. Who knows? Uh, but he made a comment and he, he's oh, quoted right, quite a bit right. in stating that essentially- that NATO would not honor or recognize any Russian sphere of influence or any Russian claims to territory outside of what we consider the borders of Russia itself. So they didn't have, and at any state around it, including the Ukraine, had a right to seek any alliance with any organization. Uh, whether it's NATO or the European Union or any other security yeah, he, so, But he's or, not a political leader. He's not a political okay, leader, right. but he's a very important person in terms of dictating NATO policy okay. in the world. And he's a spokesperson for NATO. So for a person at that high a level to basically state 
and tell the, the Putin. Russia, yeah. Putin, that you have no sphere of influence, you have no right to a sphere of influence, and that countries around you that you previously may have considered a buffer zone, uh, you, you can't make that claim anymore. Okay, so how does that relate then to the crisis right now? Okay, so let's move yeah. to 2021, right. 2022, right. where we're at. So in April of 2021, uh, there was a, a joint military exercise that the members of NATO were going to conduct mm -hmm. and started to conduct, and this was planned several months before. It was the largest military exercise in decades in all of Europe. This was NATO. Correct. It's, yeah. the, the name of the exercise, and folks at home playing along can uh, Google it, it was called Defender 21. This is not a conspiracy or you know uh, something I found on some crazy website. This was NATO policy. This was a named operation. Okay. Uh, and it involved several of the the NATO member states, including the United States, including Britain, including France, and Germany, including Ukraine. And Germany, yeah, right. Um, yeah. Yeah. And Ukraine. And Ukraine. Seven of the exercises, the military exercises, were going to be conducted on Ukrainian soil as a partner of NATO. As military. A yeah, military exercises. And the Defender 21 uh, program, military joint military exercise, the objective of that was to basically practice for a fictional war against Russia. Fictional. Yeah, but fictional at the time. That's yeah. that's okay. that's what the, the purpose was. And that was at what date? That was in April 2021. Okay. Yeah, All you right. know, again, something that was planned months and months before right. that in terms of coming together and operations began starting and the joint military drills did actually start starting in April. Uh, the United States sent seven very large warships into the Black Sea. Again, not as a hostile act. Russia was told that this was happening. It wasn't a big secret or anything, but it was a, it was a military exercise. How do we exercise. feel if there are all these Russian warships in the Caribbean? Well, we remember that in 1960. We remember that about the Cuban Missile Crisis, <laughs> right, yeah. correct? Yeah. So we yeah, didn't that regard that, that as well. terribly friendly. No, no, it wasn't Not considered. No, no, it wasn't yeah. considered an act of love at the time. Right. Uh, so, uh, so this this was a um, a military exercise that took place just last year, and it what it resulted in is the the Russians actually had a response. I mean, a verbal response, not a military one, and they stated that. Uh, you know, listen, I mean, we, I know this is fictional, but we're the bad guy in this fictional, yeah. you know, drama that you're creating mm -hmm. and these military exercises. And we consider this a hostile act, mm -hmm. you know, that you're essentially preparing for a you know, potential war against us. Uh, and that ratcheted up. Right. This uh, crisis. This crisis. So the Russians then began to uh, station you know, there have been claims of up to 70,000 to even up to 100,000 troops right. along the, the Russian border. Right. right. And that... That's the Russian border. The border on okay. the side of Russia, which exactly. again, I mean, you know, if we talk about territorial sovereignty and integrity, you know, you can do what, you're supposed to be able to do whatever you want to do within your own country right. as long as you're not right. harming people, right. you know, and creating, you know, human rights abuses. So... That, you know, so they're stationing troops along their own border. And that's you're saying then that's something I don't think most Americans know yeah. is that it was in response to this war games that right. the United States and other NATO powers were conducting right. in a Russian sphere of influence. I mean, yeah. we don't recognize. And that's what I'm trying we, to say we, yeah. is that we probably never have recognized yeah. any sphere of influence on the part of Russia no, anywhere. No, no, right. no. Now again, I mean. The, you know, Putin has always been a, if, if you watch that Showtime interview, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, his view of the breakup of the Soviet Union, it's, it's really interesting. You know, he, he talks about it historically from the standpoint that he definitely agreed with the Gorbachev administration right, right. that reforms had to be made because the Russian economy was not doing well. And uh, you know losses that had gone that go back all the way to the Second World War, but also including you know financial losses in Afghanistan at the time, uh, really damaged the, the the Russian economy. So that it had to be restructured. Right. Where Putin dissents from uh, with uh, with Gorbachev was that he believes that the state did not necessarily have to break up. Neither did Gorbachev, I don't think. 
Well, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, probably, probably not. No, he probably didn't. Not. He... Yeah. And then his 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 views of the subsequent leader Boris Yeltsin were a little bit more nuanced because he he did work with Yeltsin right, right, uh, right. for a period of time in the 1990s. Uh, but the, the belief on, on his part was that you know that the Soviet Union did not have to be broken up geographically speaking, uh, that that was an affront to the self-esteem of the people, the cultural integrity of you know the uh, the region, this massive large region. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because it, these frustrations are listed in his demands that he made to the West a couple of weeks ago on how to de-escalate this crisis. Which is? Which is to withdraw, rescind this offer to the Ukraine of joining right, NATO. Right. And also similarly to do the same with regard to the Baltic states, Lith Lithuania, Estonia, and Latvia. They're not in NATO? They are not in NATO. Yet. Yet. So, so he, by, by, by making this list of demands, uh, he is essentially, you know, critics will say that he's essentially trying to recreate that sphere of influence that the Soviet Union yeah, had yeah. without the actual territorial integrity, meaning, you know, right, conquest, right, right. you know, in, in physically incorporating these states. Okay, thank you, Kurt. Okay, so, and so the position of the United States essentially, I think, is what you're arguing. The United States appears to me to be saying that Ukraine's got the right to join NATO, and if they and if Ukraine wants to join NATO, we're going to allow that to happen. We're going to allow as long as the preconditions that are required for membership in NATO are met. Yeah, we don't care where the country is. But that's going to working. really annoy correct Putin and Russia. Yeah. And are you saying that there is at least some semblance of reason that Putin has? rather than being called the name of thug and so forth, as many Americans have done. I mean, in other words, is Putin seeing all of this from a realistic Russian viewpoint, do you think? I, or I, not? I, I, think, I think Putin is, I mean, if you want to talk about the individual, I think- No, Putin, he's looking out for Russian interests. He's looking out for Russian interests, given the- History. Given the fact, and his own history. Yeah. You know, where he grew up, the time that he grew up in, and seeing his country basically picked apart and taken apart and then humiliated uh, in the process and then going through a very severe economic recession after the breakup uh, of, of the Soviet Union. I, I think he looks at the states that made up the Soviet Union, uh, if not a part of Russia, at least a you know, a post Second World War buffer zone that was created in war. Okay, but that's in the East. Okay, but yeah. if you think about it, both Gorbachev and Putin allowed those states, Kazakhstan and so forth, to become independent without a shot being fired. Right? Yeah, a Gorbachev and Yeltsin. I don't know yeah. how much of uh, well, a, a world Putin, probably Putin had to do with it. Putin was point. later, but if yeah. you think about it, that is fairly remarkable that they let them go. Sure. As they let East Germany go, as, as they, they let, let East Poland Germany go, go, as I mean, they let Hungary go. Right, they yeah. did. They yeah. allowed the dissolution of the Soviet and therefore really the Russian Empire. They yeah. allowed for that. Right. So and I think on Putin's side, you know, there's a little bit of, you know, uh, there's a little bit of nostalgia. Kirk, Kirk. As there is in, in much of Russia. In much of Russia, right? Yeah, that, hey, look, we were a big player, the, the well, second biggest or maybe the biggest. And now, you know, we're being treated as a, a sideshow act in, in the international community. And, you know, I mean, it's, there's a national self-esteem that every country has, every country. Okay, but look, at, look, I took a class many years ago in international relations and yeah. be, it, during the Cold War. Yeah. And what, they, what that professor pointed out, there's always been two historic goals of yeah. both Russia and the Soviet Union. Yeah. The first historic goal is to create warm water ports. Yeah. And that's in Crimea. Right. Right. The second is to create buffer states between right. Russia and the West. Now, the West, including Napoleon. And specifically, it was largely. Eastern Europe. Yeah. But it was largely due to the damage that was done. Right. To the Russian people and to the Russian state, the Soviet state 
by the Germans during the two yeah, world it, wars that were devastating. Exactly, but let yeah. me point out before that, how right. about Napoleon? You can go back, yeah, another century. Okay, so right. the Russians have always acted in a lot of ways defensively. That's correct. With these, with this buffer state. Yeah. Poland is a buffer, what they used to think of, not right. anymore, Poland is a NATO. Absolutely. Okay, so though that whole area was buffer states. To right. No, they might be right or that might be wrong, but sure. I Sure, I mean, one can question whether or not, you know, an independent state has the right to say, they look, don't, we want right. to be with, you know, I know we're buffers and I know, you know, in, in, in the history of these regions, you know, that Russia, Mother Russia, has been attacked by the Germans and by the French before them, and even partly even by the British, which is yeah. a different discussion uh, uh, from the southern end. And, but that's their problem. You know, we want our own independence. No, no, I know so, that. I know yeah. that. And of course, every, I guess, I don't, I mean, that's, of course, true, I guess. Yeah. However, the Russians, see it differently. They say right. this is defensive. That, that's what I think is missing in the American mentality. The, the mentality and the narrative that we largely get from the press, you know, we, we don't talk about, and partly part of this is because of how closed off the Soviet Union is, was, Russia. Well, right, no, right. Soviet Union yeah. was, uh, in that it wasn't really relayed in historical circles and made public in historical circles until the late 1980s about how much damage Russia, the Soviet Union and Russia sustained during the Second World War. Okay, I want to close maybe by, uh, you know, by a couple other thoughts. One, I've noticed from the press and yeah. from every, almost every American that I've ever talked to, is they forget the Second World War yeah. in the first place. Right. And they forget that the Russians paid the highest, the price, highest price for the defeat of the Nazis. Absolutely. And that we were allies there's no, there's no twice. Question. Twice yeah. in the 20th century, the yeah. United States depended yeah. on Russia to beat yeah. the Germans, depended yeah. on them. Yeah. And they paid with their bodies. Right. The United States paid the highest, I uh, guess, material price. I mean, we aided the Soviet Union. Yeah. So it's important to remember, I mean, you know, it's an unfathomable number, but yeah. 27 million Russians died. died during right. the Second World War in its fight against And they were the ones who Nazi entered Germany. Berlin in yeah. 1945. Yeah. And basically helped with the liberation of Germany. Yeah, I mean, when when the during the Battle of Berlin, uh, Truman essentially did not want the U.S. soldiers in Berlin because he thought it was going to be a bloodbath. And it was. And it was. I mm -hmm. mean, I think in the, in the course of about three days, seventy thousand Russian soldiers. Died. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so uh, he was afraid of friendly fire. Mm -hmm. in terms of Russians and Americans shooting one another unknowingly, right. not intentionally. So, you know, basically he made the same calculation that the Soviets later made with regard to the U.S. prosecuting the war in Japan, said that it was just not, let the U.S. handle that part of it. And Truman said, let the Soviets handle Berlin. I know, but even in the American defeat of Japan, the casualties were mainly Japanese. Well, of course, uh, rather, uh, but I'm right, talking about in yeah, terms of right, allies. Right, yeah, no, not I know. Right, allies. right, right, yeah. right, right, right. Yeah. Or maybe you could argue that our ally in that in that theater were the Chinese, and they, of course, true, true. You know, suffered. They paid a heavy, they paid heavy a really price. Heavy. Yeah. In other words, America emerged on top in yeah. World War II. Yeah, uh, they were really the only victors. We were right. the only victor, really, when you think about it. The right. Soviets had beaten the Nazis, but yeah. I can't but imagine the price they the suffered. The price they suffered they was paid. enormous. Yeah, I just think that that should be remembered twice, yeah. though. World yeah. War One as well. Yeah. So I mean, the interesting thing here is, you know, what you can surmise is that uh, we have our Monroe Doctrine, right? Whether we, you know, and what is that? Whether, whether he's considered a good guy now or not, or just you know an old slaveholder yeah. from that time. But the Russians are not allowed to have their version of the Monroe Doctrine, which was called the Brezhnev Doctrine, that, it, you know, having a sphere of influence, that's unacceptable. Well, that's what I So that's the double standard. Right, exactly. But most uh, Americans don't know much about the Monroe Doctrine either, which was yeah. 1823 when President Monroe said the United States is going to establish a sphere of influence right. throughout the hemisphere. Right. From North and South America, and that no foreign power is going to be able to break into that sphere. Right. But that's, you know, maybe not the average person on the street, 
but you know those within the foreign policy uh, circles of the United States, the institutions of foreign policy have basically looked at that as the the you know the law, the black law. and white law, right. you know law right and not you know black letter law. Okay, so before we close, and maybe we should think about wrapping up. What's going to happen? I think there's going to be a de-escalation. Yeah, crisis. me too. I do too. Yeah, it's too it's too fiery. Yeah, I mean, again, whenever you have you know nuclear power states, uh, it, the the stakes are too high. Uh, we don't have really we don't have a legal obligation to uh, defend Ukraine. Mm -hmm. This is largely a uh, you know competition of bluster and uh, largely. You know, men trying to you know talk tough with one another. Uh, you know, talking about Biden and talking about Putin. But you know, no one wants to go over a new, go into a nuclear war. I don't war, think I know it. You know, in a situation guess. where neither party really gains that much. Nobody gains anything. Yeah. Whether the, yeah, whether the the Russians took Ukraine or whether we lost Ukraine, we quote unquote lost Ukraine. There isn't that much. Uh, we didn't lose the Ukraine. No, in, in the event that, let's say, hypothetically, Russia, you know, invaded. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, Ukraine was not a, and is not a member state of NATO. Right. We don't have an, a legal obligation to defend it. Right. Right. Although, so I, I repeatedly, the press is always talking about Ukraine as an ally. I thought the other night, we're not allies with Ukraine. No, we're not. Right. That's important to. We like know. them. Sure. Yeah. But, but it's, you know, but in these kind of circle in these, you know, <clears throat> when you have the stakes are this high, it's important to uh, recognize it's true. that also they are, not, they are right. not a legal ally and they are not, we don't have a legal obligation. And it's them. important to remember too, too yeah. that we don't really, Russia is really not our enemy. Not that I can see. Yeah. Right. But the, the foreign policy establishment in the United States is 1946. Mm -hmm has been geared towards believing that it indeed is I know. regardless of the you know the sacrifices Which of both is... countries in, in in the second world war but that's the that's the way the policy has been geared right. and that's the way the thinking is and any deviation from that is you know swiftly um uh, deemed unpatriotic in the yeah, first place absolutely before. yes all right well thank you very much kurt and maybe we'll see you again in a couple of weeks and thank you town meeting tv Sure. See you soon. Yeah.